I don't have the right to keep enabling people with that lifestyle choice. So we have to find that balance. And I think that's where the part of this comes in at. And I'm not against it, but I'm not 100% sold on that. Some of your health credits for that. Thank you. All right, we're going to come back to this question. Will you push for more parks being scheduled for land within the urban suburban area? Will you push for more parks being scheduled for the, for the land within the urban service area? I don't think we need more parks within the urban service area. I, I, we have a lot of people moving in and they have children, as well as we like to enjoy our outdoors. I mean, that's the reason why we voted for the Department of Science and Management Program and for Park Program, because we believe in that. And I think we need as much parks as we can possibly can have within the urban area. Thank you. John, this is for you. What obligations do you believe the county owes dual tax citizens in the municipalities of Longboat Key, Sarasota, Venice, and North Fork? As a county commissioner, what would you change, if anything, to ensure the fairness of dual taxation? Well, I think that the city, if you have county residents within the city, and they are paying it an example, the city of Sarasota is paying 24 cents on the dollar, and Sarasota County and the unincorporated area is paying 30 cents on the dollar. And we've been looking at the whole problem, and the city of Sarasota is being asked to contribute 54 cents on the dollar to the homeless problem, and the unincorporated area where I live, we would only pay 30 cents on the dollar. And, uh, uh, I think that there should be, uh, at any time you're a county commissioner, you should be taking, and it's a county-wide problem, you should be taking into consideration that you all, the residents in Sarasota County, I don't think Sarasota, I mean, as an example, the city of Sarasota, are already paying 24 cents on the dollar. And if you have residents like the city of Sarasota, like the Sarasota County has, to uh, uh, each, uh, an equal share, of the uh, example today they were talking about over nine million dollars then uh, the residents of the city of sarasota are totally opposed to putting the homeless shelter anywhere in the city of sarasota they're paying 54 cents on the dollar and the incorporated uh, sarasota county is paying 30 cents on the dollar and they're trying to impose that on the city of sarasota i think that i think that each time Thank you very much. Okay. All right, Lord, I'm going back to you. What will be the adverse effect upon Northport of development plans for Thomas Ranch? Well, the problem with Northport is that that's not a whole infrastructure yet um, to support a big development like that. I know it's already approved and um, has been approved for several years, but so we need to keep up with infrastructure. And then adding all those homes, and there's not enough jobs out there. These people are getting in the car and going to start looking for work in the northern part of Sarasota, so that you're going to have a lot more traffic. You have a uh, terrible infrastructure, you have uh, not enough jobs down there to accommodate all those people that are coming in. So we really need to improve the economics situation in the North Port as well as improve the infrastructure. Thank you. Shannon, with you. Was the silent report on the city IT department an accomplishment or a failure? Total accomplishment. I think that we just had to receive another audit where we're still having to pick up from where it was at. Uh, it went on to also show that we had numerous problems inside the IT section where the IT has been corrupted and there were actually ghost email accounts inside the police department and several other things. I think it exposed and, and actually confirmed what the city commission where the three of the commissioners uh, voted to transfer the IT section to the clerk's office was completely well founded. I think that's fully documented all that. Thank you. John Mayer, this is for you. Since the collection of citizen petitions in rural of the city actually increases the cost to the supervisor of elections who have to research each one submitted, what is the jurisdiction for the five thousand I'm sorry, what is the justification for the five thousand dollar fee charged to candidates declining to collect signatures? That's for you, yes. Well, uh, I think that uh, the best way to come up with that fee is like uh, some of the candidates did, and that is to obtain the signatures. But uh, in my case, I got into the late late, and so we I ended up paying the fee to qualify. So why why is it justified? 
client is charged a candidate five thousand dollars when there's really no work involved for the supervisor's elections. But yet when a candidate collects signatures, they have a lot of work to do. Well, I think I think I disagree with you there. I had excellent cooperation from the supervisor of the elections office when I went through this. I just went down to the staff and, and they walked me right through the process. Okay. And uh, I think it's, I think it's a fair assessment. Thank you. All right, Paul, I'm going to ask you this. List three things you would push for to solve the problems of River Road. What's the three things that I would push? Three things that you would push for to solve the problems of River Road. Handle the capacity, handle the capacity, handle the capacity. It's an it's, uh, a, uh, evacuation route for hurricanes. Um, that's one of the most important things as a, as a major arterial uh, to get folks out of the area. That's really the only issue with it. Okay, thank you. Pete, this is for you. Having experienced personally the difficulties of raising campaign funds while seeing large sums raised for some candidates by special interests, what campaign finance reform would you advocate for? Any, any kind of a change would run afoul of the First Amendment. You can't change it. Okay, um, just a little unclear. What campaign finance reform would you advocate for? I wouldn't advocate any. Anything okay. you would do would be against the First Amendment. Okay, thank you. Paul, this is for you. List three items to increase or decrease the county, in the county budget. List three items to increase or decrease? In the county budget. Uh, increase taxes. Increase revenue. No. Um, Three things. I would say that. Um, let's see. Three things would really increase. Uh, it would probably increase certain user fees where it was applicable. Um, other than that, I can't say specifically what I would increase or decrease. Okay, thank you. Ray, this is for you. Many see the Herald Tribune as biased. What do you think is the proper role of journalism in relation to local government? Uh, the proper role of journalism is really, I think, the way we used to do journalism. When I got out of school in 1980 and went to work for the Venice Gondolier, it was a small town newspaper. It was twice a week and then eventually became three times a week. And we were very different from the Herald Tribune even then. Um, we, we sought to find all the sides of the story, um, regardless of our opinions as reporters. You don't bring that to the table. You, you interview everyone, you put together the story, and you let the public decide. The Herald Tribune always seemed to have an agenda, even back in the 80s, and it was it was very evident. Um, but we, we didn't take that road. I think um, journalism is supposed to be unbiased. Today, it's it's just kind of sickening. I mean, it's entertainment. It's Fox News versus MSNBC. Um, it's just, you don't get the real story. You just get someone's opinion, and it's and it's presented as news. Um, you turn on the radio, the same thing. Um, it's entertaining. I have to give it that, but it's really, not journalism, and it's not the way I would talk about it. Thank you. Pete, I'm going to ask you this question. List three solutions you would propose to resolve some of the perceived corruption in local politics. <laughs> well, I think we need to have a little better reporting. For instance, uh, uh, when, I get a, when I get a contribution to say, $200 from a developer like I ever would. But it doesn't really come from the developer, it comes from a uh, person who's uh, related to him, and it asks for the profession, and the profession is housewife. Uh, there's no way that, uh, say, John Susie can, uh, can uh, sort through it and say, aha, uh -huh, that's a developer. You see, so, so in other words, you, you might be able to ask for more reporting. You might ask for another column and say, uh, housewife to whom? Perceived corruption. Oh, well, it's not perceived corruption. It is corruption. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
aging infrastructure, driving on clogged roads, coping with aging schools and failing services, will bear many burdens from the death of 2050. Is it fair to exempt developers from fiscal neutrality? Well. Just yes or no? This is the yes or no answer. Is it fair to exempt them from fiscal neutrality? No. Okay, Greg? Paul, we'll start with you. 